It's three o'clock, uh, three o'clock. So let's get started. Welcome to the panel, uh, Care for Older Adults and People with Disabilities. To really briefly set up the stage, today, one in four US adults have a disability that impacts their uh, major life activities. And as we're living longer these days and our population grows older, there are increasing needs for long-term care and in-home care. We have to figure out how to embrace these demographic changes with dignity and grace. The pandemic has laid bare the inadequate patchwork care infrastructure in our society, <coughs> resulting from decades of underinvestment and ableist, sexist, and racist assumptions. Lacking robust support, unpaid family ca caregivers and low wage caregivers, who are predominantly women, immigrant workers, and workers of color, have been shouldering the costs and performing the essential work of taking care of members of our society in need of long term care. This panel brings together experts on long-term care to discuss the promises and challenges in the existing uh, system and policy proposals, such as the Build Back Better plan for, for overhauling the long-term care systems and expanding access to care for people with disabilities and aging adults in the United States. Before we delve into the panel, some housekeeping issues. Oh, we're having some technical issues here. I can drop it in the chat so you can continue. Okay, I need to see the slides though. Okay. Um, okay. We're sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll just uh, a couple of things uh, from posting and navigating the Zoom. First of all, uh, you're welcome to share this webinar as this webinar on social media using hashtag uh, care infrastructure 2022. And another thing is this webinar will be recorded and made available after the event. Please put your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the, of the screen. And for technical reasons, questions in the chat would not be asked. Uh, but you're welcome to chat with your fellow attendees using the chat button. Um, and also, you're welcome to introduce yourself, uh, put your names and organizations where you come from in the chat. Um, and both panelists and attendees are welcome to share any res online resources that you think will be helpful and relevant for the panel in the chat. Um, and closed captions are available for attendees on Zoom. To turn on closed captions, please click the CC or live transcript button at the end of your screen. Finally, uh, we want to remind everyone, we ask that you keep all discussion in the chat respectful and follow Zoom community standards, uh, which prohibits abuse and hateful conduct. And we reserve the right to mute uh, individuals and remove them from the webinar if they violate these, uh, these guidelines. All right, let's, um, so we're honored to bring together a panel of researchers and policy advocates with deep ex expertise on long-term care and family caregivers. I'm not going to um, read out their full bios because they're available on the conference website, but very briefly today, we have a Robin, Dr. Robin Stone, who is a senior vice president for research at the Leading Age uh, and co-director of Leading Age Long-Term Services and Support Center at the UMass Boston. We have Dr. Font Cawthorn, who is the Hunt Research Director at the National Alliance for Caregiving. We also have Dr. Musumi Bose, who is, the, um, who is currently a faculty member uh, in the Department of Nutrition and Food, Service, uh, Food Studies at Montclair State University in New Jersey. Um, and we have Bethany Lilly, who is a Senior Director of Income Policy at the ARC. And, Dr. Jennifer Kraft Morgan will be our discussant today. She is the interim director of and associate professor in gerontology institute at Georgia State University. Um, in the next an hour and twenty minutes, we will first hear from us, our speakers, following by uh, followed by a commentary by Dr. Jennifer Kraft Morgan. Dr. Morgan have also prepared some questions for the panelists, and we will also selectively take questions from the audience and have um, a conversation with the panelists. 
Without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Robin Stone. Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I am very happy to be here um, remotely, quite honestly. I'm on vacation. I'm at a yoga retreat in Costa Rica, but I did not want to miss this conference. And the beauty of Zoom is, is that I can do both. So um, I've been having this wonderful yoga retreat, and now I'm going to share uh, some sort of overall background information on long-term services and supports, and then talk a little bit about uh, the policies that are currently um, trying to respond to both the short-term COVID needs uh, of the older adult and younger people with disabilities populations, but also the long-term uh, efforts to transform the sector. So for those of you who are not immersed in uh, long-term services and supports as I have been for the past 45 years, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a definition of what we're talking about here. Um, I, I, I usually start with saying that there's something very unique about long-term care and long-term services and supports. And, and by the way, long-term services and supports is really the umbrella term for, uh, for long-term care, for long-term supports. It brings it all together. Um, and the reason for that is, is that this LTSS is at the intersection of medical, social, and physical environment needs of individuals. Um, it is much broader um, than medical care. It really involves both the, the need for social, um, social services, social interventions, and also pays attention to the physical design and um, potential for modifications in one's own home and in the neighborhood as well, and, and the, the whole larger community. The other thing that's important to understand with this, um, these services and supports is that the focus is really on function and adaptation to the environment. It is not treatment or cure, which is one of the reasons that we no longer re really re refer to this as long-term care, but more as long-term services and supports. And the goals of LTSS are basically to allow people to live as independently as possible for as long as possible. You can function quite well with a lot of chronic conditions and disabilities if you have the kinds of interventions and supports um, that allow you to do that. And that is really the focus of LTSS. At any one point in time, we have over 12 million people uh, in the United States that are in need of long-term services and supports. And most importantly, most of this long-term services and supports are pr provided in an unpaid way by family and friends. Uh, that does not mean that it is free labor. Uh, there's tremendous uh, opportunity cost as well as real costs associated with family caregiving uh, and uh, relative caregiving. But, um, but that is the vast majority of the services that are provided. Uh, and the next group after the family caregivers are, as was said before, the um, frontline, what we like to call the frontline caregiver professionals, who um, I'll talk a little bit more about them, but they are the ones who really do the vast majority of hands-on services and supports in the various settings where LTSS is provided. So with that as, a, as an overview, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what I call the triple knot of long-term services and supports. Um, and that has to do with three different aspects of LTSS. The first one is how do we finance? How do we pay? How does public policy and the private sector pay for these services and supports? The second part of the knot, the second piece of it is the delivery settings and systems. The, the um, places where people receive their services and supports and the systems that are designed to make this happen. And the third and one in which I have been involved for many, many years and it's sort of my bully pulpit uh, concern is the workforce, which is often been undervalued and even underinvested in and, and, and not really paid very much attention to, which is ironic given the fact that this is a very labor intensive sector. And if you don't have a quality workforce, you cannot possibly achieve good quality outcomes in any type of delivery system. 
Any type of financing that we are able to achieve will not be successful without the investment in this workforce. So that's very, very critical. So what is the status of um, the financing today? Just so you can understand how challenging all of this is for all of the stakeholders that are involved. Um, you heard before that this is truly a patchwork system of financing. At the, at the policy, public policy level, we have state, federal, even some local funds that actually are also um, part of this, but there's also a big chunk of long-term services and supports that are out of pocket, um, that are not covered by any kind of public policy and public financing mechanism. Uh, in, this, in this world, Medicaid is the major public payer for long-term services and supports. Um, and so if you are able, if you spend down or if you are already living at the uh, economic po almost poverty level where um, most people would begin to qualify for Medicaid, then you are entitled to nursing home coverage. You are not entitled to home and community-based services, however, because in the 60s, when Medicaid became a national, uh, a federal state program, uh, the entitlement was to the nursing home, and there was hardly even any discussion of home care or other community-based settings. And it was only in the 1980s that we began to see an expansion of waiver programs and personal care option programs at the state level that began to expand uh, the potential for folks who wanted to remain in the community or other community settings like assisted living or small group homes to actually um, receive those services through Medicaid. But again, not an entitlement, and it varies tremendously by state. If you're living in a state like Washington or Oregon, where there's a very robust home and community-based services program, you're likely to have access to these types of services and supports if you are Medicaid eligible. If you're living in a state like Mississippi uh, or some other states, particularly in the South, uh, you're not gonna be so lucky. You're not gonna have those advantages. Um, then, then we talk about our other major uh, public payer for healthcare. And as many of you probably know, the Medicare program is the medical care program, insurance program that covers uh, medical care for uh, older adults age 65 and older, younger people with disabilities, some who qualify for Medicare, and a few other folks who fit in here. Um, but Medicare does not cover long-term services and supports. And I think it's sometimes confusing because we start hearing about things like skilled nursing facilities and home health care. Well, the skilled nursing facility Medicare coverage is for only for post-acute care, which is uh, basically up to 90 days or 120 days of, of um, care. And it has been cut back substantially over the years. So the average uh, amount of post-acute and the skilled nursing that people are receiving is 21 days. Medicare home health is also a post-acute care benefit. It is not long-term services and supports. Um, there are a couple of other uh, federal programs that actually cover long-term services and supports. The VA, for example, has a very robust program for veterans. Actually, um, some of the best models of alternatives to nursing homes have, have started and come out of the VA system. And there's also other programs like the Older Americans Act, which cover things like case management and um, service coordination, that kind of thing. And then again, a large proportion of what is paid for for long-term services and supports is out of pocket by individuals and their family members. There is very little private insurance for this, um, for this uh, part of the, this, this sector and private insurance has not grown over the 40 years that I've been looking at, uh, at the financing issues. So it's a, it continues to be a very small segment. There have been a number of federal uh, social insurance initiatives over the years to try to get coverage for long-term services and supports without having some kind of means testing like having to spend down to Medicaid. Uh, all of them have failed. I have been involved in at least three of them and um, it is a very, very difficult road to hoe to get financing at the federal level, unlike some other countries in Europe and Japan and Korea, uh, where they have a 
uh, a fairly robust uh, long-term services and supports financing program. Washington state is the only state so far that actually has statewide LTSS financing. It's a fairly modest program, but it is an example of where states have taken the lead because the feds have not been able to get it together. So if we move to the next um, discussion points that I wanna talk about, um, the question is, you know, where are people getting their services and supports and where, where are these um, families and where are the paid uh, frontline care professionals doing their work? Um, again, nursing homes have been around for many, 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 for many, many years, but they really became, the modern nursing home was designed in 1965 with the advent of Medicaid. And that's why we have these things that look like hospitals because Hilburton dollars were used to invest in the capital development of nursing homes and they sort of look like hospitals. You know, you have your double loaded corridors and all of those other really ugly things. It certainly does not look like a home. Assisted living came, came about in the, really in the 1980s and 1990s in an effort to shift uh, from nursing home to a more home-like environment for people who could live without very high acuity. Um, unfortunately, what has happened with assisted living is it is, it is a very expensive model. It is covered by Medicaid in many states through waivers, but the coverage is really very limited. And so assisted living has become pretty much a wealthy person's um, alternative to the nursing home. And the other thing is, is that the nursing home has become much more high acuity. A large proportion of people currently living in the long stay part of nursing homes have dementia and a lot of other chronic conditions. And most of those people are actually going to die in the nursing home. Um, adult daycare is a very small part of the sector. Um, I, I don't know if any of you know the PACE program, the program for all inclusive care for the elderly, which is our only example of a fully integrated system of long-term services and supports integrated with medical care for nursing home certifiable individuals. But PACE uses the adult day center as the basis, as the sort of home, the hub for all of the services and supports that are delivered to folks who qualify and, and are part of that program. And then over the past few years, we've had tremendous increase in managed long-term services and supports where the states have turned over a lot of their programs to managed care organizations, uh, many of whom also have Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, and we've seen also a tremendous increase in home care um, both at the state level and also with the managed care organizations that are looking to experiment and expand um, the dollars that they have from the state by focusing more and more on home care options. Then real quickly, let me turn to the workforce itself. As I said, this is a very labor intensive sector. 60 to 80 percent of all the hands on care is delivered by these frontline care professionals. These are terribly undervalued folks who are called low wage workers, which I hate that term. I've expunged it from my vocabulary. These are professionals in a professional occupation who unfortunately are paid on uh, very low wages. And we'd, we'd have, a, have to have a whole day to actually go into the reasons behind that. But suffice it to say, it's an undervalued workforce, majority female, people of color, low income, and a large proportion between 25 and 30%, depending on the setting, are immigrants. So um, a very, very uh, important part of our LTSS system. And yet many of these folks live in poverty and a large proportion of them are actually receiving public benefits, which is a travesty in the 21st century that we would allow this to happen. Recruitment and retention are both the two-edged sword of the challenges in workforce. And these challenges were around before COVID hit and COVID has just exacerbated this problem substantially where we are now seeing serious worker shortages and absolutely no pipeline. So it is not only difficult to retain, but when we are trying to recruit, um, it has become a disaster. First of all, all these sectors are competing with each other for the workforce that is out there. Wages have been bumped up 
because there's competing in these marketplaces. Um, I am wondering myself how sustainable the, these bumped up wages are going to be, when, particularly with inflation. And when we start to see the post-COVID era, whether we're really going to see, and I hope we do, continued attention to how we uh, increase Medicaid reimbursement, um, think about how the providers actually should be paying more for the, the labor and the care that, and supports that are being delivered, and also whether the public is going to be behind uh, really supporting this workforce and not thinking of them as just people who could just as easily go and work in um, McDonald's or, or some kind of other service industry. This, these are people who are living, working in people's homes, whether it's a nursing home or somebody's individual home, and the competencies that are required to do this work are very, very skilled. So it irritates me often when we talk about how transferable this low wage workforce is with other low wage workers, because the skills and the competencies are very unique to long-term services and supports. These are not um, dispensable folks at all. They are, they are highly um, qualified when they get the right training and they need to be valued in that way. So with that, let's turn a little bit to um, what are the policies uh, in COVID right now and in post-COVID? And I'm going to start with a little bit of a discussion of the ARPA funds, which are basically the, the recovery, uh, the American uh, Recovery Payment Act. This is where the dollars have been infused into the system to actually try to do a few things. One is you've got an enhanced 10% FMAP, which is the federal match to the Medicaid, state Medicaid programs, states that are interested in expanding Medicaid home and community-based services can and are, have applied for this funding. It's a huge increase in dollars, um, has to be spent by March 31st, 2024. So there's a very short window of tremendous infusion of dollars into the system with a heavy focus on increasing access to home and community-based services. Um, supporting and protecting the, the HCBS workforce, ensuring financial stability of providers, and accelerating long-term services and supports. I also want to say that in addition to this, this specific focus on long-term services and supports and in the HCBS home and community-based environment, there are also other dollars. There are other ARPA funding dollars. Dollars, for example, for Older Americans Act, home and community-based case management, and some modest bump in an investment to the National Family Support Program. So there, it, these dollars support strike teams um, to help nursing homes during COVID and um, QIOs, quality improvement organizations, to help with CQI efforts. This is an effort to actually try to transform the quality work that is being done in the nursing home sector. And there's also money for workforce development, career development, um, helping the um, frontline staff to actually move to uh, higher careers, as well as career lattices where they become specialists in dementia or Parkinson's or mental health, behavioral health. Um, there's also increased subsidized childcare slots in the ARPA funding and increased premium pay of up to $13 per hour for essential workers. And this frontline care professionals are part of that essential worker pool. And um, ARPA has been a manna from heaven for states. I have, um, we do TA with quite a few states. I was just on the phone with the um, director of older, older adults and disability services in the state of Maine. Uh, Paul Sosia and I go back a long way, and he said he never in his wildest dreams when COVID hit thought that they would have, they're swimming in money right now. The problem is, is they've got to figure out how to use it and how to use it wisely. Um, they're investing in Medicaid reimbursement increases. They're investing in training, competency-based training. They're investing in career ladder development. Uh, they're investing in um, other types of looking at new models, for example, being more efficient with how, how home care staff are um, assigned to individuals instead of having uh, a four hour for each individual, which is really inefficient because many people don't need four hours a day. 
Some do, some need 24, but most do not need four hours a day. So trying to triage those dollars. So some people who need two hours a day could get that. The aid could deliver six hours to somebody else. Of course, this is really gonna happen in much more densely populated areas and the rural areas are um, a totally different ball of wax that I think we could also spend a day talking about. But suffice it to say that these dollars are big. We're talking about billions that have been invested uh, with ARPA funding. And it's gonna be really important for the states to figure out not only how they use it now, but how they start to build in sustainability. Because once you bump up these wages and you have these other programs, if they end in 2024, we're going to be back to square one, having set much higher expectations, particularly for this workforce and for the people who are receiving services. So this has to be sustainable over the long term, way beyond 2024. Um, the question about the potential for Build Back Better, as all of you know, um, we had a couple of Democrats who really put the squash on Build Back Better, and we have yet to see um, this bill come to fruition. There is a substantial, started with about $400 billion, was knocked down to $150 billion that's supposed to be invested in the home and community-based community system and workforce. There's now discussions, and we could talk about that after the, all of the presentations. There are discussions about um, the pieces of this bill um, being pushed through as separate pieces of legislation. It is possible that we may see some focus on the HCBS uh, services and workforce as a separate bill um, because there is increasing attention to this. People are recognizing that older adults and younger people with disabilities who need these services really need this workforce if we're gonna have the infrastructure to support it. Um, also significant state activity as I said, we are seeing increased Medicaid reimbursement with specific pass-throughs that ensure that these dollars are going to the frontline workforce. Exploration of more standardized training and even a universal worker programs that would allow these aides to work across all settings. Right now, the training requirements are different for nursing homes, assisted living, and home care, and that makes for crazy making. So there are discussions about trying to develop universal programs that would allow these folks to work across settings, which we are advocating at Leading Age and I think makes infinite sense. Career advancement, not just in nursing, but in social work, human resource development, and career lattices that allow folks who love being AIDS but want more work um, that's specialized to become a dementia specialist or to become a behavioral health specialist and to get made, importantly, to get paid more for that. Pipeline development with high school students, refugees, and displaced workers, and new value-based payment models that are supposed to strengthen both the post-acute and the long-term services and support sector and create more incentives for integrating and using these dollars more efficient, efficiently. And I will close by saying, how much will this remain post-COVID? I think maybe we can have a really good discussion after everybody has presented, but to me, that is one of the big things that I think is a is challenge because all of this challenge hap was, was around way before COVID. And this infusion of dollars could be really quickly drying up and then we would back, be back to square one if we don't build in the sustainability mechanisms. And then I would finally say, the two things that are most critical here is what is the future of financing of LTSS and what is the future of the professionalization of this workforce so that we no longer refer to this, this caregiver workforce as low wage and they no longer are low wage, but, are but these are seen as valued occupations. So with that, I hope you've gotten an overview and I will stop there and turn it over to the rest of the panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Robin Stone, for your fantastic overview. Now we'll turn to Dr. Musumi Bose and Dr. Fong Cawthorn, who will be presenting, um, share their insights from the recent report that they put out through the National Alliance for Caregiving uh, on the caregiving in a diverse America and the implication of their findings. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. 
Um, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to be um, a, a part of this really important conversation. Um, I should disclose that both Dr. Cawthrid and I are researchers um, and we feel very passionately about this subject, um, but we're still, uh, at least for me, I, I still feel like I'm still learning a lot about the policy uh, end of things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus a lot on the, the research that we did for uh, our report, uh, Caregiving in a Diverse America, beginning to understand systemic challenges facing uh, family caregivers. I'm gonna give you some of the data that we got and, and, um, and then Dr. Cawthorn's gonna take it over and talk about um, how the, 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 um, the research has, has the potential to inform policy related to uh, US care infrastructure. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just said this, so we can go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the report itself. This, so this report was published uh, late last year and um, so this, the, the report itself, uh, the, the data that we got from it was from a secondary analysis from the caregiving in the US uh, data set. Uh, that was the, the a joint collaboration between the National Alliance for Caregiving and the AARP. Uh, this data was collected from the 2020 data set. And I should disclose that this data was collected in 2019. Um, so the information that I'm gonna be presenting here today is, uh, is does not actually reflect the impact of COVID, although we would expect that the impact of COVID has uh, really heightened some of the, the disparities that we see uh, will probably would probably heighten some of the disparities that we see in this uh, in this data. So the overarching research question for this secondary analysis was: uh, Do caregivers of diverse backgrounds experience uh, different outcomes related to uh, their caregiving uh, responsibilities? And when we're talking about diverse backgrounds, the characteristics that we were looking at were differences across uh, race and ethnicity. Um, LGBTQ status, uh, income, and uh, ge geographical location. And when we're talking about outcomes, uh, we were talking about uh, effects on physical, emotional, and financial strain, um, uh, caregiver and uh, caregiver activities of daily living, and um, caregiving intensity, and the resources and information used by um, by caregivers. So when we put this in for this data together, uh, we reported it. We reported the data in a descript, descript, descriptive fashion um, with simple uh, statistical uh, comparisons across across groups. But then we also used um, the expertise of um, some statisticians at Dartmouth who conducted uh, a number of logistical regression analyses um, across some of these outcomes to. Uh, to control for uh, some of these confounding variables. Uh, so I'll start by sharing a little bit about the data set itself. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we, the caregiving in the US uh, 2020 data set included about uh, responses from about 1400 uh, caregivers uh, 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 that participated in this uh, this national survey. And uh, the first thing I kind of want to highlight here is that the majority of the the people that responded to uh, to this survey were uh, did identify as non-Hispanic white. Uh, so that is a, a limitation that we have to sort of account for in this study and also gives sort of information on uh, you know future research implications that, Involve better engaging uh, communities of color and caregivers of color in research in research like this. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to pre present. Be, I'm going to just give you a very uh, short, brief snapshot of some of the findings from this study. Um, you are welcome to look at the National Alliance for Caregiving uh, website, where you can access the full report. Uh, but we're gonna, I'm going to present on three major uh, outcome domains. One of them is financial strain. Uh, so what we found is that uh, family caregivers spend over $500 billion a year associated uh, with um, in costs associated with providing care for their care recipients. And when we stratify the caregivers that, uh, in, that participated in the study by income back bracket, those in the lowest income bracket uh, were more likely to assist with um, activities of daily living, including helping their care recipient in and out of the shower or the bath, um, uh, grocery shopping, meal preparation, as well as um, overall housework. And 
uh, caregivers in this lower income bracket were also more likely to uh, be in need of services uh, related to respite, um, services related to uh, needing home modification, as well as seeking out uh, services and information uh, using the internet. And um, looking at this sort of uh, the, the stratification of uh, by income, we found that more uh, Black and African American caregivers, as well as Hispanic and Latinx caregivers, were in these lower income uh, brackets. They uh, had a, 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 the additional um, uh, the uh, additional likelihood of assisting with all of these tasks related to daily living, as well as having uh, more financial impacts uh, compared to non-Hispanic white caregivers. Next slide, please. When looking at the out outcomes related to mental health, uh, we found that um, across uh, you know, our diverse caregivers, Hispanic, Latinx, um, Asian American and Pacific Islander caregivers, as well as our Black and African American caregivers, uh, their self-reported overall health was uh, had declined over the last uh, several years compared to the data set from the uh, 2015 Caregiving in the U.S. Uh, study. And um, if we look at Hispanic and Latinx caregivers, they reported that they were uh, more often the primary uh, and sole caregiver uh, for their care recipient and Perhaps related to that, they also reported um, lower psychological as well as physical well being um, when caring for their care recipients. And when we looked at the experience of Asian American and Pacific Islander caregivers, um, many of the Asian American and Pacific Islander caregivers uh, in their caregiving role felt that they had no choice in taking on this responsibility. When we were looking at our LGBTQ caregivers, um, compared to non-LGBT caregivers, uh, uh, LGBTQ caregivers found themselves more often as the sole and primary caregiver as well, and they were more likely to uh, uh, report feelings of isolation and feeling alone. Um, and this may be related to um, the, the continued uh, bias and discrimination against um, the, the uh, unique sort of family structures of LGBTQ caregivers and the overall LGBTQ community. Um, so that's just a sort of summary of um, some of the disparities that we found across these uh, different backgrounds that we were looking at. Um, one thing that we saw that was really interesting, and if we could go to the next slide, it, and we titled this sort of domain as unique experiences um, that we found in trying to better characterize the, uh, the experience of caregivers from these diverse backgrounds, is that um, is that, you know, there, although lots and lots of progress needs to be made, compared to 2015, um, uh, Black and African American caregivers reported that they felt that they had a, a greater role in decision making for their care recipients. And a really interesting finding that we, uh, that we saw in our report is that um, despite this increased burden that we see across our, uh, our caregivers of color, in Black, African American, Hispanic, and Latinx caregivers, they reported that they were less likely uh, to experience emotional strain from their caregiving experience, which may have um, relations to sort of the cultural kind of influence of uh, caregiving in these uh, communities. And I think the sort of big takeaway here is that it's really, um, it, it, it's really important to not just do this type of research to figure out where, where there are disparities across different groups, but also it's really important to characterize these very unique experiences. And, um, and there are things that we can learn from these unique experiences that can be used to uh, improve the quality of life for all uh, family caregivers. Um, so I'm gonna sort of pass the mic to uh, Dr. Catherine uh, to talk a little bit more about the implications of our study. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you, everyone. Um, so when we're thinking about some of the implications from this report, given the varied and unique experiences of caregivers, one of the implications um, specifically for research is that we need more research, um, especially when we're considering um, the intersectionality of uh, different identities and experiences, particularly of caregivers. Um, in addition, when thinking about implications for research and or practice, you know, we also want to be paying attention to whether or not these, these um, that we are having culturally tailored, culturally relevant materials, as well as resource, de de excuse me, delivery. And so essentially what that is, is knowing 
who do you want to reach and what makes sense for them? And so some questions that I'll give as uh, some potential examples are, is it the right format? You know, do, do the individuals that are being targeted or um, that are being approached in these in communities, do they see themselves represented in recruitment or programming? Um, is it in the preferred language or does it take into account varied langu various language proficiency uh, levels? Is it available or can it be delivered in um, the right place? And so some of the places may be, you know, trusted environments or organizations and even home, you know, is that even a possibility? Um, and are different modalities possible? And when I think about these different types of modalities, I mean, are we only providing things in a written format or is there room for something that's visual or auditory? If we're providing it in different platforms, are you only doing it online or are you, is there a possibility for someone to do it on their phone or text messages? Um, is it accessible? You know, you just want to make sure that there are um, particularly for different caregivers who may have a variety of um, contexts, you want to make sure that you're able to reach them where they are, whatever that looks like. And then uh, along the same lines in terms of implications for programming, um, we want to make sure that things are less restrictive and more inclusive um, with uh, eligibility criteria specifically. And as my colleague mentioned, you know, when you're looking at um, specifically um, gender uh, queer or um, LGBTQ communities who define family differently or who define family beyond what we have traditionally, you know, gone by for many years and honestly is almost outdated. It's family is no longer just biological. I mean, that's still a part of it, but it also includes how individuals are identifying their family. It's their community of choice and the programs that they rely on um, may have limited definitions that are still um, very much exclusive. Next slide, please. And so now when thinking about some of the implications for this work and how it may um, relate to policy, the Build Back Better plan um, is one example of how to support diverse caregivers. Um, the American Families Plan, it, it calls on Congress to invest um, $225 billion over a decade to create a national com comprehensive paid family and medical leave program. And so some of those pieces include partial wage replacement, 12 weeks of paid leave, um, including family leave, um, illness, personal safe leave, bereavement leave, um, in addition to, you know, just again, the wage replacement, especially for those who are from the lowest wage um, workforce. And so Potentially, if we can pass the Healthy Family um, Families Act, this will require employers to allow workers to approve seven days of paid sick leave per year. And so, what I what I see in terms of the policy or um, of this is that you know when we talk about the financial strains, um, the financial implications, especially in communities of color who are caregivers, you know these are the types of things that can um, help guide. Um, these are the types of policies that can help in. Um, that can help reinforce and support caregivers in a different way. And so while overall it's still too early to say what will happen, and you know, in some ways it <laughs> it's a little discouraging, but we still don't know what exactly will happen, but we do know that the potential is there to support not only family caregivers, but persons living with disabilities and older adults. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. All right, so um, that concludes um, our uh, kind of tag team approach with this. And so I think we'll be able to have time for questions at the end, but we've included our emails um, as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Masumi and Fawn for sharing uh, insights and implications for, of your study. Um, next, let's turn to Bethany Lilly. Hi, everyone. Oh, slides. Um, yeah, we'll be sharing slides right now. Thank you. I always find slides to be helpful. They keep me organized and kind of structured on things. <laughs> so was glad that that was an option here. Oh, we're getting a giant close up of my baby Yoda yoga uh, Lego in the back. <laughs> yeah, here it goes. Um, awesome. Um, uh, just as a preface to this, um, I think you're going to find a lot of my remarks mere remarks that Dr. Stone made earlier in this presentation. Unlike the rest of this panel, I am a lobbyist. I am not an academic or a researcher. Um, but many of the same issues that Dr. Stone identified that we see in this research, the, the burdens that family caregivers feel, the um, 
incredibly, incredibly low wages for the direct care workforce, that frontline disability service provision um, folks. Those are those are issues that the disability community and the aging community struggle with together. Um, but I think my presentation is going to have a slightly different. Um, I don't think I have control over this, but if we could move to the first slide. Um, Sorry about the technical issue we're running. <laughs> we're going to be have, fixing that the whole day. Um, but that's partially because of that one in four or one in five Americans with disabilities number that was cited at the beginning of this panel. We are talking about a hugely diverse population. We are talking about people like me who have a disability that's not apparent when you first meet me not going to necessarily be something that you're ever aware of until I feel comfortable saying, yeah, no, um, COVID was really not a good thing for me to catch because of the immunocompromised issues I have, because of the lung condition I have. It's really not a good thing for me to be exposed to. That's why I wear masks outside a lot of the time. Um, and then you also have people who use wheelchairs or have other disabilities that are immediately apparent to everyone. Um, and there are folks among that population who may just use the wheelchair. They might have a few other health conditions, but they may also need a personal care attendant every day to come in and help them get in and out of bed, to help them with other activities of daily living. Um, and then you have folks who have other types of needs. So I work for the ARC of the United States and we represent people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that would include autism and Down syndrome and conditions like that. Those folks are gonna need considerable more care uh, care services or, or services and supports that relate to how to interact with the system, making sure they're set up, set up for Medicaid so they're getting the services they need, mm. maybe meal preparation, figuring out how to use public transportation, these kind of things. For each person with a disability, the services they need are going to be very different. Um, but by and large, whatever type of services are needed, um, it's primarily paid by, provided by either unpaid family caregivers, which is where paid leave is incredibly important, or it's provided via paid caregivers through Medicaid. Um, I think Dr. Stone did a great job of pointing out that Medicaid really is the backbone of our entire long-term services and support system. We get a little bit of funding from Medicare, a tiny, tiny amount. We get some out-of-pocket spending, um, but we really don't, I mean, Medicaid is really the only game in town when we're talking about paid caregivers in this way. Um, there are other social programs, and I think that this gets at some of the issues that um, the research that we just discussed got into, which is families need a lot of support if they are providing that unpaid caregiving. So respite services, things like that, where you can actually help family caregivers deal with this are incredibly important as well. And that's kind of captured by the other social programs bucket here. Um, we also rely a lot on other social programs for um, people who are low income. And I also don't really like that term, but it's hard to come up with another way to describe this. Um, because many people with disabilities rely on Medicaid, they are trapped in poverty. They are not able to get out of poverty because the healthcare services they need to do the things that all of us do, like get out of bed in the morning and go to the grocery store and do all of the rest of that, require them to remain eligible for Medicaid. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, this, so when I think about care and people with disabilities, I think, I think mostly about the same things that Dr. Stone thinks about. I think about expanding home and community-based services, about making sure that those services are available for everyone. I think about paid leave so that family caregivers have that flexibility if they need to take time off from their jobs. But I also think about it for people with disabilities like me who work and are in the economy and might need it for our medical conditions one day. Um, and I, I, one thing that I, I really wanna kind of focus on here is when you think about people with disabilities, you're thinking about parents, you're thinking about people who are gonna have caregiving responsibilities themselves. Some of the research that's been done in this actually suggests that people with disabilities provide more care than other populations because we're so used to receiving it ourselves. And I think we can often recognize when care needs to be provided. So paid leave is not only important 
for my own medical condition, for other people with disabilities, medical conditions, but it's also important for us as caregivers to have access to that. Um, if we wanna to move to the next slide, thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about home and community-based services and drill down on that because I think Dr. Stone did a really good job of talking about LTSS and nursing homes and some of the congregate care settings that fit within that big picture. Um, but home and community-based services are really kind of have a unique history. Um, as Dr. Stone talked about, and I, I told you there were gonna be a lot of overlaps in our presentations. Um, this was a system that was really built out via Medicaid waivers. So for the IDD population that I represent, we had a 1915C waiver that was instituted back in the 80s. These waivers are things that states apply for every couple of years. They cover a very particular set of services that are targeted to people with IDD. We have similar waivers for people with physical disabilities, those often overlap with the older adult population because that's gonna be a lot of similar services that folks need. Um, I would actually argue that we need to be looking at IDD services for some of the other supports that we need for older adults, especially older adults who are encountering problems with um, cognition or with kind of mental functioning rather than physical functioning. I think we've got that side of older adults pretty well figured out, but I don't think the mental health side of that or the kind of mental piece of it has been, and I think it could be really well informed by people with IDD and other work there. Um, and I think a really important point to make about home and community-based services and why we ended up with these waivers is that that's what people with disabilities and older adults want when you survey them. They wanna live in their homes and communities, they wanna age in place. They don't necessarily want to live in institutional settings. And so if we can incentivize that and reverse the institutional bias that exists in Medicaid, um, Dr. Stone mentioned that nursing home services are mandatory and that HCBS are much more optional. That is something that the disability community really sees as a huge problem, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. But um, this desire can be seen when we look at kind of how these, how we're spending this money. So if you go down, I actually am gonna ask you to go two slides and then go back. Um, but we can see this desire for HCBS in the funding and the, the way that LTSS spending has broken down over the past several decades. Um, it started out primarily as institutional long-term services and supports, and then we saw a slow evening out and expansion of home and community-based services. And that's because that's what people wanted. Um, if you look at these years, it's also because we started spending more money on that. And part of that is the increase in the aging population, part of it is inflation, um, but all of this to say is HCBS is now half of what we spend our LTSS dollars on, and that's because that's what people want. They want to live in their homes and communities. For the disability community, I also want to note, this is a civil rights issue. We have for decades seen this as something where to us, being able to live in your home and community was not always something that people could be. If you look back at the Olmstead decision, if you look back at lawsuits that disability rights advocates brought, it was about making sure that we could have that access to the home care services or the home and community-based services so that we folks weren't forced to live in institutions. Um, as somebody who represents people with IDD, places like Willowbrook in Pennsylvania that were shut down because of the massive um, abuses that were taking place in those places, you know, that's that's really the, what has driven a lot of this shift in the disability space. Um, but as we've built out these services, I think becoming aware of them and knowing that they're, they're better quality, the pandemic has really put a fine point on that with the rates of death that we've seen in congregate care settings. Um, and so that's really important. But the other point that Dr. Stone made that I think is really important is financing is one of the biggest questions in my mind about this. So if we wanna go back one slide, LTSS financing in this country is, as, as we've all said, like mostly Medicaid. So if you look at Medicaid, you're looking at over half. And these numbers are a little old. Kaiser actually just released new numbers on HCBS funding specifically um, today. I got the email and I was like, shoot, I don't have time to change my slides, but um, I will drop a link to the new report in the, uh, um, in the chat so folks can have access to it. But Medicaid is really the game in town, except for out of pocket and 
uh, there's a very limited amount of private coverage here. So that being said, what, what do we do? What do we do? We get Congress to invest a bunch more money in the system. Um, so Dr. Stone mentioned that the Build Back Better Act originally had $400 billion invested into home and community-based services. These are the numbers for the entire LTSS system. And as you can see there, it's right just under 400 billion. So we were talking about massive investments into the HCBS system. Down, now that it's down to about 150 billion, that would still be completely unprecedented. And that would allow us to, for the first time, rather than building from waiver service to waiver service to waiver service, actually do that structural transformation and make sure that these services are available to everyone who needs them. Can we move on to slide 19? Because there are a lot of issues with the home and community-based service system. If we think about problems that we see in those service systems, um, the big one that comes to my mind, and I know that many families in my network worry about constantly, there are waiting lists. You have to get on a waiting list in order to access home and community-based services. And these waited, there are almost a million people on these waiting lists across the country. That is why all of these family caregivers feel so stressed and so strained because they can't access the paid services that would help them actually care for their family member. Um, the other major crisis, and I think Dr. Stone talked far more eloquently about this than I will at this point, there, the wages for the direct care workforce are not living wages. They are so low that there are constant staff turnover. It's completely ridiculous. And because these wages are set under the Medicaid program, they sometimes are even less than minimum wage in the locality or city or state where the individual lives. And so we are really not encouraging that high quality workforce that Dr. Stone says we need and that we do need desperately. Um, and this is really, to my mind, a place where, low, where the direct care workforce and people with disabilities have exactly the same interests. We all want to make sure that we have high quality services being provided, and we want to make sure that everybody's getting paid a fair wage. And so if you've seen the Fight for 15 and you've seen other direct care work actions over the past many, many years, you have likely seen people with disabilities and their service providers out on the front lines together because everybody understands that this is the same fight. We need more money in the system. Working together is the way that we get it. So moving on to the next key slide, please. So I talked a little bit about the Build Back Better investment, but I wanna flag two specific bills as well because I think they can be helpful when you're thinking about this. Um, two of the biggest champions in Capitol, on Capitol Hill on this issue are Debbie Dingell, who went through a home care experience herself when her husband John um, became very sick and then unfortunately passed away. If his Twitter account is still active, and I will say he is one of the, was one of the funniest members of Congress on Twitter. So if you're looking for some way to spend your afternoon. Um, but Representative Dingell leads with Senator Casey, who has also been a long-term champion of, of issues that impact people with disabilities, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. And this is the operationalized way to, this is the bill that basically got added to Build Back Better that covers home and community-based services. And it includes this massive billion dollar investment into home and community-based services. And most importantly, it specifically targets wages and raising the wages of that workforce as one of the most important things that states need to be doing with that money. I also want to flag that it makes the Money Follows the Person program completely permanent. This is a program that helps transition people from institutions into their community. Um, as I mentioned, most people want to be there, but oftentimes they may end up in an institution either because they need additional skilled nursing or for other reasons. And this, this program can be incredibly helpful. It increases Medicaid funding in these circumstances, so people can get a little more support in that transition. Both of those things were included in the Build Back Better Act. Um, the Making the Money Falls per, 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 Person Program permanent is part of the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. This all gets very messy, but um, I wanna specifically name these things because I think they're both important policy developments. Next slide. Um, I also wanna flag a couple of other more broader systemic proposals that are out there because 
this is something, as Dr. Stone said, that Congress has been thinking about more than I've actually seen them think about it in many years. Um, in 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a discussion draft released um, on the HCBS Access Act, which would make HCBS services a mandatory service in Medicaid. I mentioned earlier that that would put them on the same fit footing as many institutional services. And that would help address that choice challenge. Like people don't now necessarily have a choice about what they want. They, they basically have nursing home services or they can sit on a waiting list. So this can be, this would, balance that out. And we were very involved in the drafting of this. Um, Senators, Senator Casey and, and Representative Dingell and Senator Hassan took a bunch of comments on it. So I'll be really curious to review those comments. I think it got a little on hold because of the pandemic, um, but I'm really looking forward to that discussion. And then the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction in the House, had a discussion draft around a Medicare Part E. So we talked about how Medicare doesn't cover these services it could, Congress could make that decision that they needed to cover it. Um, and the question is, will they? But I think the fact that the relevant committee thought that this was an interesting proposal to discuss and put out there is a really positive sign. Um, next slide. So at this point, I'm gonna flip pretty dramatically just into paid leave, because I think that's also an important thing to keep in mind. And I talked a little bit earlier about how important it is because people with disabilities are going to need paid leave for all the same reasons that everyone else is. And because it's really important for family caregivers. That's one of the things that I hear the most from my network is almost always moms needing to take time off because they have a child with a disability and that child's services or supports have gotten disrupted in some way. During the pandemic, we saw this with everyone effectively needing to take time off. Um, a family I know in Massachusetts had to like, it was mom and dad and then two sons, one of whom has a disability and his brother was just like, well, I guess I'm just gonna quit my job for the next couple of months because we can't get served the services we need for his brother. And so when I think about paid leave, I think about family caregivers on top of thinking about people with disabilities ourselves. So if we move to the next slide, that example I gave of having a brother, um, that's really important. And that's not something that's currently covered by the FMLA. Um, family needs, the, fam the definition of family for paid leave, at, uh, any type of paid leave legislation needs to include siblings. It needs to include grandparents. It needs to include everybody who might be asked to provide care in some way like that. Um, progressive wage replacement is another really important thing. Low wage workers are not going to take this benefit if they can't replace most of their salary because they just won't be able to afford to. Um, job protection and continuation of health insurance are also really important issues that I think don't get enough attention. If you have to go out on FMLA leave now, your job is protected and your benefits, your health care benefits will continue, which if you're going out on medical leave is really important. Um, the other pieces of this, I think, you know, many, many family caregivers are part-time workers because of the demands of their caring and paid leave is not generally available to part-time workers. And that's something I think we could really think about and think about improving. Um, so moving on to the next slide. The major legislation that is Congress is considering around this, um, it was mentioned that paid leave was part of the Build Back Better Act, and it was. Um, that is a point of um, complication right now with Senator Manchin, who um, really doesn't like paid leave. He said this publicly a couple of times. So I just like, I want to caution that like many, I, I don't know what, how to, I don't know how to be too optimistic given the statements that Senator Manchin has made about the inclusion of paid leave going forward. I will put it that way. Um, but there are other legislative vehicles that have been introduced that might be an option and that Congress could consider moving. Um, the Family Act is the kind of key lead vehicle here. It provides paid leave via a comprehensive social insurance model. So you pay a little bit through your FICA taxes on your paycheck, and then you get the benefits later on. That is how almost every state that has passed a paid leave program operationalized this. Um, it's very different than the approach taken in the Build Back Better Act for reasons that if folks have questions about that, I can get into that. But there are also other proposals that are very different. There are a couple of parental only policies 
that borrow against social security benefits or borrow against the child tax credit, both of which are just a way to not have to put any new money in the system um, without and still provide some type of parental leave. Uh, my organization opposes those kind of proposals. Uh, I think of them personally as kind of payday loan proposals where like there's a benefit you already need and then people are asking you to like take a cut against that benefit for something else you really need. Um, one of the new proposals that I think is really interesting is from Representative Underwood, um, the Job Protection Act, which was actually just introduced this week. And it is an FMLA reform bill that is specifically designed to reach more low wage and workers of color who are traditionally excluded from FMLA. And I, we're very supportive of this bill. I think it would be great. In addition to supporting workers of color and more low wage workers, it also supports more workers with disabilities because they disproportionately end up working part time or end up working um, low wage jobs. And so this is a win win for everybody. And I would really like to see something like this move. Um, Moving on to the next slide. I did, like, it's not a complete presentation for me if I can't talk about a few of the other supports, but I'll finish up really quick because I know we want to get to questions. Um, childcare supports for families with disabilities are really important, especially ensuring that those childcare supports are accessible. Um, Right now, the way a lot of childcare is handled, kids with disabilities can actually just be excluded from it. That's not against federal civil rights laws, which you would think it might be. Um, the child tax credit and earned income tax credit are also great income supports along with SSI and social security. Medicare is really important healthcare coverage. It's acute coverage, so it doesn't get into the home and community-based services or the LTSS, but it is really important coverage, as is the Affordable Care Act. And then nutrition assistance and via SNAP is something that my network, folks in my network rely very heavily on to kind of make up that difference. Um, uh, just of this list, child care, the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, um, and Affordable Care Act coverage are all under consideration for inclusion in the Build Back Better Act. And so that is where the other reason I wanted to touch on this is, you know, if we're looking at the Build Back Better Act as a kind of organizing way of thinking about these issues, it's really interesting to me that so many of these issues are all being wrapped up in this one piece of legislation. So here is my final slide. Uh, if we can go to the next one. What is going on with Build Back Better? And I think Dr. Stone said she would ha be happy to answer questions about this. Um, I would love to hear her perspective. Um, my understanding of where we are now for everyone's benefit is that Joe Manchin has pronounced Build Back Better completely dead, um, but he went and talked to Politico yesterday and said that he supports doing some type of legislation through the budget reconciliation process. Um, internally, we have been referring to this as the bill formerly known as Build Back Better um, because we think it's funny and we needed something to laugh about. And so, um, I think it'll be really interesting to see. I don't know that we have all of the details right now about what this compromise piece of legislation could look like. Senator Manchin specifically called out climate provisions and social spending provisions, which I think indicates he's really thinking about this. We've had some meetings with his office around many issues. And I, I as I said, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical on paid leave, but I do think there's an understanding that home and community-based services need the investment that's been, being, been under discussion about lately. So that is my understanding of where we are on Build Back Better. And I'm really excited to take questions from folks. So I will uh, be quiet now. Thank you so much, Bethany, for providing a very comprehensive overview of um, challenges and opportunities for care, providing care for people with disabilities. And now let's turn to Dr. Jennifer Kraft Morgan for her comments. I wanna say thank you to the panelists for doing a fantastic job. I just, I will keep my comments short so we can get to questions. But um, I really what I really like about this panel is that we um, put all of the people who are important in this discussion together for once. Usually we have a disability silo and an unpaid caregiver silo and a paid caregiver silo. And, um, and we are not doing that here. And that's really exciting. I think that we really have to coalesce, as Bethany says, together because all of those people are important stakeholders in um, improving the system. Um, 
one thing when we think about uh, redressing the care infrastructure, I mean, I think that's clear through these papers that we need to financially support through paid leave, through taxes, through subsidized programs, through West respite, through waivers, any way that we can, both paid care partners and unpaid care partners and actually care recipients and try to figure out where that balance is and really understand that ecosystem of care so that we can um, bolster the whole stool instead of have it continuously falling over on top of people of color and people who are economically vulnerable. Um, and then I think that this strong cultural and value-based emphasis on home and community-based care is through all of these papers is huge in trying to get us to understand uh, how we should reframe the financing system. As Robin was talking about, you know, skilled nursing care is the most subsidized by federal sources. Um, the rest are patchworks of Medicare, uh, Medicaid, uh, a little bit of Medicare and private pay and Older American Act dollars and everything else to try to just fit it together. And if we want home and community-based care to be the main type of care, we need to keep moving that um, needle and having more resources for home and community-based care. The other thing that I really like about all these papers, the emphasis that um, Fawn and Musumi did on um, diverse caregivers, the emphasis that uh, Robin made on um, frontline professionals, not low wage workers, um, is and what Bethany said about people with disabilities. People with disabilities have long said nothing about us without us. And I think that that's one of the things we could be moving forward with and really thinking about, you know, this is nothing about us without us for people living with dementia, people living with disabilities, people of, of um, color who are disadvantaged by these systems, these um, low wage workers who are really care professionals, but don't have any of the benefits of being care professionals attached to their jobs, um, other than the meaningful work and the skills that they have, but the skills are gendered and raced and not valued. And, um, and I think we really need to think about that borrow from the disability community and have them show us, you know, some of the advocacy. Also, we see that, um, in some of the changes in the way that we think about care recipients as older adults, we're really thinking about people living with dementia and living more fully with dementia. We're thinking about older adults living more fully. And that is also, you know, really borrowed from uh, the great work that the disability community and disability scholars have done. And that is also a really important piece in thinking about how we talk about this and move forward together. I mean, I just like to see that these silos are finally being broken down. I hate to see it because we have so much crisis and so much pain in the system, but at least maybe we could all work together um, and not see those buckets as really different. Unpaid and care and paid care uh, have so many things in common, just as people with disabilities and older adults have so much in common. Uh, and so moving that forward is really key. So I'm going to get to questions. There was, I have a couple of questions myself. There were, there was one question in the chat for Robin, which I think is worth asking. Um, Isaac said in New York state, the proposed fair pay for home care act would raise home care worker pay to 22.50 an hour and would raise Medicaid reimbursements accordingly. Accordingly, some of us have pointed to the possibility of using ARPA funds to cover the first year of wage increases have any other states considered such a possibility? Yeah, uh, yeah, and they have. Um, certainly, um, New Jersey is one state. North Carolina has been considering. There, I mean, all of the states are using ARPA funds. So um, the question is, you know, I, as I said, my concern is it. The window for this is basically a three-year window. And then what happens after that? Um, does it fall off the cliff and then there's no more? Does it retro back? I mean, I, I just, you know, I'm not, I'm not clear. And I, when I talk with state officials, they're not clear either because where's the money gonna come from? So it's great to legislate these things. 
Um, right now, they've got money from ARPA to do some of these things, including not just the wage increases, but a lot of more bonus pay, which is coming out. A lot of the states are using this for bonuses, which, you know, I have a really bad feeling about bonuses because they're not, they're not a great policy for fundamental change in what we want to have happen. I mean, I'm, we advocate for a living wage for these frontline professionals and a living wage is at a market level. It's not at a state level. You can't really legislate it at a state level, but we could get started with at least some of these bump ups as long as we then got the traction. And I think some of this is, pu is public commitment. Um, you know, one of the things that I have talked with people about is that maybe because these living wages are really at the local level, that we also start looking at policies at the local level, local levies, other kinds of taxes, earmarking par parts of property taxes or other kinds of things that people would not necessarily want to happen at the federal or state level. But we have examples of where they've been able to pass these types of local initiatives because they're very committed to their, the people that are being served and the people who are doing this work at the very local level. So I think we've got to be creative about it. And I think the problem for the New York folks is, you know, New York already, well, the state is a little different from New York City, but in general, New York is further, has been further along in wages to begin with, partly because the union has been so strong there. So um, it's just very, very complicated. And, um, but, but I do know, to get back to the original question that ARPA funds are being used a lot for the short-term bumps. Can I just add on? This is why we need the money investment from, from the Build Back Better Act, because yeah, that would extend the ARPA money yeah permanently. <laughs> and if we can do that, then we don't have that cliff in states. I think, I mean, that was always the intention was that the ARPA money would be short term yeah. um, with the follow up of actual investment. That's so right. the need that folks have. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, <laughs> policy, policy makers have, have very short, short time frames in there. And they're depending on what position you're in. Um, so, you know, it's really hard to have a long view of this, but this is a, these are fundamental transformations that have to occur that are built into the fabric of budgets and that recognize that this is part of the sectoral effort to make this happen. And I also just wanted to say, I love, I love Jen's concept of, of breaking down these silos, have everybody coming together. I mean, we've seen a lot of that in, in, in disability and aging, we've seen less of that in paid and unpaid care. And I think it would be great to coalesce around the frontline caregiver professional and the family care partners all coming together around this because there's huge numbers in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on, follow on to the matching dollars. The the One of the things that I think is happening in red states is that they're not, finding the match or not willing to give the match and then they're not able to use the, the dollars. Um, which, so, so even if bonuses, bonuses are better than nothing, even though bonuses aren't sustainable. And uh, I didn't know if you had any um, insight about the red states and, and what they're doing because of that disparity that you talked about in terms of state, you know? The, the, we haven't done a, a 50 state analysis of this. I mean, Kaiser, Family Foundation and a few other groups. Um, NASB has done some work. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't, I mean, there's a lot of bonus money in this, in the ARPA. And so, you know, I think that the red states are doing bonuses, um, but it's a really thin band aid. Um, and it says something that they're not, they haven't applied for the FMAP. This is why I think the public needs to understand this. They don't understand the implications of not really arguing for this kind of investment that has been put on the table that ultimately affects their loved ones, 
and the people who are going to be doing that work. So um, I think it's a political. It's it's a it's there really a there is a serious need for polit, for public education around all of this because I don't think they understand it. Not that it would move the red states, but at least there would be more of a voice. It's also going to become a huge, growing problem over the next several, like two decades. And red state or blue state, you're going to need to be ready to address the long-term care needs of the boomer generation. And they are not ready for that. Um, I mean, this is why investment in home and community-based services right now, that is probably the most important thing you could do in your state to prevent the kind of long-term cost that you're looking at, but it's not something that I think, I agree with, with Dr. Stone, like the more public awareness we can get of this, the better, because we're just, sometimes as doing this advocacy work, I feel like I'm shouting into the void about something that everyone should be talking about. Absolutely. And we have a question or a comment from the audience here. Right. Hi, Hi, I'm Mary Hansen. I'm in the department here at AU. And I want to follow up on this discussion by asking somebody to, to tell me what they know about the status of the Supplemental Security SSI Restoration Act that um, Chad Brown had put forward and that I had understood to be wrapped into the bill formerly known as Build Back Better, at least in some draft or another, um, because it, it is such an important aspect of the structural deficiencies of care. And so I, my interest is mostly at the moment in IDD, um, but as we pointed out, these are all so overlapping. Um, I, yeah, so I think I'm just gonna see what you all say. I, I wanna open them. So unfortunately, the entirety of the SSI Restoration Act was never under consideration. Pieces of it were at varying points of the discussion. Um, asset limit increases from the $2,000 they are now to $10,000, which I'd prefer to see them eliminated, but we can, $10,000 would at least prevent a lot of the churn that we get right now in SSI. Um, other pieces around employment supports, around people being able to keep more of their earned income or more of their social security benefit if they're dually eligible and a particularly like kind of low income senior. Um, Unfortunately, uh, with the cuts that we've seen to the bill and with Manchin's proposal, I, unless it's a very small fix, I think it's very unlikely. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you. Like this is a piece of the structural problem we have here because the people who are eligible for SSI are going to be the folks who need HCBS. Like if you're meeting that standard, that's what you need. Yeah. Um, or you're old enough and low income enough that you need those supports. And yeah. so. Yeah. I mean, the, the only way if any of this could survive in there, if they, if it were slipped in and it, it was so small that nobody was paying any attention to it. I mean, part of the problem with the build back better was it, it was such an omnibus bill, um, you know, people strategize back and forth around whether there needed to be separate bills that really kept separate and then you could get more through or go this whole big nine yards here to try to get something really big, push something really big through. But, you know, we couldn't even get it through the Dems. <laughs> so um, I will I say think that's I think that's I think the SSI discussion and again, I don't think the public understands SSI. I mean, I am a survivor. I, I got SSI benefits as a dependent child when I was growing up because my father died when I was very little. We could not have survived without those benefits. And, and um, both SSI and SSDI, I mean, there's a, there's a need for the public to understand all of these. I mean, one of the reasons that I like the long-term services and supports benefit, if you could think about how to design it, is that it takes it out of that and just has it available for everybody. It won't solve all the problems, but it would solve some of it in terms of putting money in everybody's pocket. So, but it'll make it more patchwork too. I mean, we just have a humongous, horrible patchwork system, and each of them have terrible limitations in terms of 
eligibility and disincentives to actually get some of these benefits. Yeah, it, it's really it's really a mess. I mean, I, I've begun to think about creating an index of marginalized groups, which yeah, is it's a complete in, mess. In, well, it's an inverse of the number of programs you have to patch together to keep anybody alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, my a lot of we do a lot of work in low income housing, which then becomes even worse because you've yeah. got those and then you've got the subsidies for the housing side. And, you know, you're trying to get these people on SNAP benefits and you're trying to do this and do that. I mean, it is a nightmare. So. I don't know. And I, you know, and then I would say, you know, to talk about the frontline professionals again, many of them are on many of these benefits, yes. which is insane. But they're caring for people and also on these benefits. You know, 40% of the AIDS are on public assistance. That is a crime. So. But it also has implications if you start raising wages, suddenly they're going to lose their Medicaid. Absolutely. Coverage. They're going to Absolutely. lose their gap. And so you have to look at the That's whole right. wage picture to make sure that you're making right. the toll for what they're losing. Right. We can't, if, that, if, you, if you set them off at that cliff, then they are, they've lost everything else that they've gotten because of their eligibility for these other benefits. But public needs to get this, you know? Yeah. They, we have to all be in this together around understanding this, you, you know? Well, and I really like the point that was just made in the chat about people who are in non-Medicaid expansion states who can't, who care for people on Medicaid, but can't get Medicaid themselves. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's insane. So what they did at the opening this morning was they let every uh, each of the panelists say one thing one thing that you you could change today, what would it be? And so um, in, in the hopes of, of ending on a slightly more positive note, uh, <laughs> maybe we could go there. So Masumi, can you jump in? One thing that you would change based on your research and, and report? Um, so I'm going to speak obviously from a totally different you know, perspective and point of view. Um, I, I, I love learning about policy and I love conversations like this. And I, I always feel like, oh my gosh, I've learned so much today. Um, I'm a strong believer that, you know, that um, research informed policy uh, is, is, is really important. Um, I think speaking from the context of um, trying to understand the, the disparities that we see with race and other uh, demographic variables in terms of um, you know, not just policy, but also research as well, sort of starting there, like we, in order to best serve these sort of underserved populations, I think we really need to change the way research in these, um, uh, of these populations is done. And this is one of the biggest, I, I sort of alluded to this in my talk is that the, you know, just simply the, the fact that this was just a secondary analysis means that there's so much work to do. We need to go into doing research like this where our primary intention is to try to understand what are the experiences of people from different backgrounds um, on you know, caregiving as well as other sort of health related outcomes and how do we account for things like intersectionality as well as segmentation within a population. Because if we just sit there put this blanket term on Hispanic Latinx, we are really not seeing the full picture of the entire uh, Hispanic Latinx community for, for one example. So my sort of thoughts is let's, we need to think about better ways to engage uh, communities of color in research like this so that we can better serve, uh, better serve them in policy efforts. And I'll stop there. Great. Vaughn, you wanna take it? Sure, I'll just say, actually, I was thinking very similarly, maybe that's the academic side of <laughs> myself and my colleague, but yeah, I'd, I'd actually just love for us to make sure that we're um, actually kind of doing the reverse, like what is happening in the policy world so that we can inform the research so that the research can get done so that we can then do the back translation, like that is what we need. And so this breaking down silos that you brought up is like, this is what, it, what, it, what we need. We need the researchers, we need the different communities and sectors, like we need everybody because we cannot continue to do what we've been doing. So that's my last point. Thank you. Great. Bethany? 
So this is actually really funny because I ask this question to almost everyone I interview for a job because <laughs> I think it's a really good way to understand kind of how they think about policy. Um, so you're on the hot seat. I want to I want to change all of it. I want to change all of it. Like I, I want to get one thing. I, okay, so I've only get one thing. Um, I want to fix exactly what Dr. Stone identified that like not everyone has access to home and community based services. I want everyone to have that access. And if they do, I think we'd be in a very different place. And that would get at all of the systems that we need to change. I like it. Robin, you want to take us out and close it? Or do you want to change? Uh, well, I, I do think if we had a if we had an LTSS financing that focused only on home and community-based services, which I, which is basically what Washington State did, make it a more robust than what Washington State did, and also tie into that something around a livable wage or something that is that also ensures that the benefits also can accrue to the people who are doing the work then you would get money in the hands of everybody, including lower income people, because it's not means tested. You'd still have the Medicaid at a, at a, as a bottom, but everybody across the age spectrum would have access to dollars, which, which literally purchases these services and supports, and that is designed in a way that it is, it helps with being able to at least get to a livable wage. So there'd be more language around the workforce than I've ever seen in the LTSS financing bills because they really just assume a status quo with the workforce. Um, but this would benefit families, it would, be, it would benefit the, the frontline workforce, and it would also benefit obviously the consumers of these services. So, and other countries have done that. They're not perfect programs, but you know, many, many other developed countries have done it. They so, exist. Anyway, that they would exist. be what I would change. It does exist, yes. Right. Excellent. Thanks. Well, we are one minute over time. Back to you, Sheng Wei. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I mean, please give a round of applause to our great panelists in this just really thoughtful and robust discussion. Um, and uh, as we see in our panel, all of these issues are interconnected. And I encourage everyone also to check out other sections of the conference. Tomorrow, we have a section on, um, uh, on pay, pay care workers. So hopefully, we can continue these important conversations. And again, thank you so much for all our panelists and for the attendees who participate in, our, in the session. That's great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.